In that story, where I want to end is with Rahab, verse 31. By faith the harlot Rahab perished, not with them that believed not, when she had received the spies with peace. The story of uh, Rahab I have in parentheses throughout there. Joshua sends two spies to the other side to spy out the land. Now these two spies want to be inconspicuous. What's one way to be inconspicuous as you nose around? They went into a prostitute's house. It would look like they were there to do business. It was a normal thing, evidently. Rahab had her own apartment there on a city wall. So uh, probably wasn't frowned on as much as, as much as it used to be in America. I'm not sure it's frowned on in America anymore. But, um, but they would have seemed like travelers passing through going into Rahab's house of prostitution. Kind of like the one in New Orleans. There was a house yeah, in New Orleans. Is that how it goes? New yeah, old, no, we old, that. Cut that it. part. But anyway, uh, so you, you've got these spies trying to be inconspicuous. But word comes to the king that a couple guys are nosing around from Israel, from the tribes of the Hebrews. So, he heard they went into Rahab's house. So they knocked on the door. He sent uh, people to find out. Rahab hides them and said, well, they were here, but I sent them on their way. They just left. If you pursue them, they went that way. You'll probably catch them. Now, why was she helping them? She says, as you read the story in Exodus, we've all heard about what God's done for you in the wilderness. Armies came out and attacked them as they were passing through. God gave them easy victory in every one of those situations. The Red Sea uh, parted. These stories pass on. You don't need newspapers. Somebody you see that rides to the next city and tells them. News got around. She said, I know that God is going to give this city, Jericho, into your hand. And I'm going to help you get away if you promise to me that you'll spare me and all my family, my mother, my father, my brothers, my sister, and all their family. And these two spies gave a promise that they knew Joshua would honor. You help us out. You get them all when we come. You get them all in this room. We don't know who they are. They go out from this room into the street. We don't know them. They're going to die. And we're free from our promise. You give them in your room, gave them some scarlet rope and stuff to tie to signify to all the uh, uh, Israeli soldiers, you don't touch them. And uh, God protected all them because of the faith of Rahab. Rahab also is mentioned in James chapter 2, when James is talking about faith. I find this fascinating. By the way, there's more said in this verse about Rahab right here. One verse in Hebrews 11. In that one verse, there's more said about Rahab than every other name mentioned in the rest of the chapter. That I'm ta talking about that follows this. Obviously, there's more about Abraham and uh, Moses. But every name mentioned that follows Rahab has, and, and there's some big names, Gideon, David, uh, Samson, some big names, just mentions them in passing. Rahab gets the whole verse. And so I got to thinking, what do I learn from this? Why did God choose to have two writers of New Testament books? Mention Rahab with esteem. A harlot. God certainly doesn't look kindly on uh, any kind of adultery. 
let alone prostitution. Why did God honor Rahab? What it teaches me is it doesn't matter to what extent some human on this planet has fallen in to the very depths of sin. No matter how deeply they get involved with sin. Today's world, they could be a serial killer. They could be a rapist. Things that we would abhor. A child abuser. I'm, I'm talking about not what they call child abuse today, you whip their butt. But I'm talking about people who misuse children sexually, who inflict great pain upon them physically. Child abusers that we disdain. I'm not talking about Adrian Peterson who went overboard with the whipping. I don't even know what I'm talking about here. People really abusing children. We disdain them. No matter what kind of evil you think about, cannibals, people that kidnap people, kill them and eat them. We've had that in our country. Doesn't matter how deep they've fallen. What Rahab shows us is if somewhere after that journey into the depths of sin, faith happened, they become a part of God's program. She's spoken about twice in the New Testament. Now why is this important to me? If I think, you, you know the story of the prodigal son, we call it the parable of the prodigal son. It isn't. It's not about the prodigal son. It's about the loving father. The Jews thought that you could go so far and there was no hope for you. So Jesus told this story about this wayward son who fell into such depth of depravity that he ended up doing the one thing a good Jew could never do, feed pigs. And in Jesus' story, Dad's out looking for him every day. That's who the story is. It's a parable of the loving father. The loving father never quits looking. That's the story. And that's where we're at with Rahab. Yeah, she was a prostitute. We want to write people off. God so loved the prostitute that he gave his only begotten son that if faith would happen, they would not perish but have everlasting life. And if I don't get this, then if I assume the mass murderer, the serial killer, the rapist has crossed the line where there's no hope for him and they can never be saved, then I have imagined that somewhere God drew a line in the sand and said if you cross this line, there is no hope for you. The problem with that is, I don't know where the line is. Amen. And if I don't know the li where the line is, I don't know what side of the line I'm on. Yep. The only way that I can absolutely know that I'm forgiven is because there's no line in the sand. Amen. Whosoever